That's good, yeah, that's good. Well, hey there, good morning. I know I say this every, every Sunday, but I, I really mean it. It is good to see you. <laughs> every, every Sunday, I am genuinely uh, joyful to come here and gather together to worship God. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see.
Well, good morning. You can be seated. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome to Macedonia. We're thrilled that you are here. Uh, I want to do a welcome to our guests. And then today is graduation Sunday. We have a graduate that we're going to recognize in a second. But first, let me just say welcome to our guest. If this is your first time visiting with us, we want you to know you're a special guest of ours. We're thrilled that you are here. Uh, and a lot of what we do on Sunday mornings is to make this a welcoming place where you can connect with people, you can hear God's truth, you can worship your Creator, uh, and just have a good time being with us because God is doing some great things and we've got some wonderful people in our faith family and we're excited that you chose to be here this morning. We ask a couple things if it's your first time visiting. They're both very simple. One is on the back of your message bulletin. Uh, there's a simple little area that you can fill out and there's two black boxes on the side walls as you leave. You can place them in there, or at the end of the service, I'll be in the back over here on the side with Jason, our development pastor, and you can come back there, hand them to me, and if all you have to do, the second thing, come back there, say hello, introduce yourself to me, and our church has a special gift for you that we'd love to give you. Um, the main thing inside of there is we want to treat you to a cup of coffee or a muffin or something at the coffee shop here on the square in Jackson. All we ask is you just come say hello and let us know that you were here. Uh, if you're online with us this morning, you're a special guest of ours too. We have uh, our virtual campus staff who are there monitoring the system. If you just put in the chat box where you're watching from, if you have any questions about our service, about our church, about something you may hear in the sermon, feel free to interact with them. We're here to help and serve any way that we can. Uh, and it's interesting, we know that a lot of people, we've shared this with you, they will watch online for weeks and months before they ever come visit here. Uh, and so we look forward, if you're online, to the day that you come hang out with us here on campus and get to know us a little better. Uh, inside your message card, there's a lot of announcements you can check out. VBS is coming up. There's some information about that. Uh, some com community outreach events that we're doing with the Loving Lunch this summer, feeding the children again here in Butts County. Uh, and you can read everything that's in there that's going on in the life of our church, or you can use your app and go to the church news page. And there's a lot of information there, too, of things that are happening in the life of our church that you're going to want to be a part of. All right? So with that, we want to recognize Miss Hannah Reagan. Miss Hannah, if you will come up here with me, and Jason and Candy, if you'll come too. Most of you know Miss Hannah Reagan, uh, but if you don't, um, she has, it was interesting, they've been a part of our church for years, and she was actually three years old when she started here at the day school and has grown up in this church. So I am just curious, if you're here and you remember Hannah when she was here at three and you have taught her in Sunday school, had any influence in her life over the years, would you slip your hand up real quick? A lot of hands. So I just want you guys to be proud because uh, it takes all of us as a church, as a faith family, to love on children when they come in, see them come through their student years, and then head off into their career, their college profession. Uh, and it's also a lot of work for Jason and Candy. Y'all were very fortunate. You had it easy with Hannah, at least we think. Y'all may have had it rough, but we think. But this is Hannah. Let me just share, you a, little bit, share a little bit about Hannah with you. So Hannah is the daughter of Jason and Candy Reagan. Jason is our development pastor. Uh, Hannah attended Strong Rock and is graduating from there. And the activities that she had there, she's a member of the National Honor Society. She's on the Patriot Ambassador League. She has served on several mission teams going to Alaska, Costa Rica. She's going to be attending Southern Crescent Technical College to study radiology, specializing in MRI technology. Hannah's life verse is Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, yes, amen. Stay right there for a second. So our church has a gift we want to present to Hannah. These are some wonderful flowers that were made by Miss Becky Bias for you. And this is a gift on behalf of our church to you just to let you know we love you, we're so proud of you, and we look forward to what God does with you. All right, so let's pray for Hannah, okay? <laughs> Father, we love you and we just thank you for your love for us. And God, we're thankful for this morning that we can celebrate Hannah. God, what a blessing it is uh, to be able to stand here with her and her parents. God, to know that she has walked faithfully with you, and God, know that as she graduates high school, she will not graduate from her faith. But God, that she will continue to grow in your word and the truth and understand what you've called her to do and the purpose you have for her life. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for how she leads us in worship every week, how her sweet and humble spirit just does so many things around this church that many of us don't even recognize or see. And God, we pray your hand of blessing be on her as she graduates, she goes to college, let her be a shining light for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
let her live always for things that are eternal. And God, let us continue just to encourage and pray for her. We thank you for Jason and Candy and the time they've invested into her life, God, to get her to this point. The teaching and the correction and the love and the Bible studies and all the things that happen in their living rooms and by the pool and on vacations, all the conversations for all these years, Father, that have helped shape her into this beautiful and wonderful young woman. So Lord Jesus, let us continue to trust you. Uh, pray that you would use her in a mighty way for kingdom work. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we invite you to stand with us. We're going to continue our time of worship uh, as Ben and the praise team lead us.
chapter 3. We're going to be there this morning, but it's going to take us a minute to get over there, so just kind of mark your spot and hang out with us for a second. But if you've been with us over the past few weeks, we started a sermon series. Today we're in week 3 of it called Seek, and it's kind of challenging us to think about the things we seek after, things that are important to us, things that we prioritize, and how many times those things leave us empty, they leave us wanting more, longing for something else, Uh, Many people could tell stories of things that they sought after in their younger days, and it was just empty promises. And then through a course of events, through people in their life, they found something that was meaningful and lasting and resonates with them for eternity. And that's kind of what we're trying to walk through here is, God, what are the things that we should be seeking? Because there are so many things that compete for our attention and call to us and really demand our attention. And so we started out kind of thinking through this definition of think and le- of seek, and let me just walk you through it. The word seek means that we are trying to locate something, we are trying to discover it, we are actively searching for it. That's one definition of seeking, and this is what we do in our lives. We're locating, we're looking, we're actively pursuing something that would bring us meaning. The second part of the definition of seek means this, that we endeavor to obtain it or reach it. Meaning we're going to go to whatever lengths we have to go to get it, to possess it. This is what seek means. It also means to move towards, to go to. That the direction of our life is moving in the direction of that thing that we are seeking. And one of the things we hit on was this Forbes study. And I'll be honest with you, there was a couple verses and that Forbes study that I found back in 2016 that kind of connected this sermon series for me. And in that Forbes study, they did this interview of all these companies and people, and they asked them, what is it you're seeking for? If you could break it down to one word, what is it that you're after? What is it that you are trying to locate? You're endeavoring to obtain. You're giving your life to move towards. And the number one answer that everybody gave was happiness. I want to be happy. I just want to find a way to have some happiness in my life. And one of the things we talked about, what this Forbes study did, is they pressed people. They realized that everybody that was searching for happiness was doing it for all the external things, through all external stuff. If I could find the right job, the right spouse, find the right diet plan, whatever it is, it was all external. And even Forbes came back and said, you will never find happiness through the externals. Because they always change, they always fade, the new truck breaks down. You with me on this? Things begin to wear out. It never fulfills, but it's one thing we seek after. The other thing people said, which is probably not surprising, is money. I wish I had more money. That's what I'm seeking, the right promotion, the next pay raise. And when Forbes pressed people, they realized in that study there were people that were multimillionaires and there were people that were living off minimum wage, and all of them said, I want more money. And so they came back and said, there's a problem. If you have millions, you want more. And if you, in essence, have nothing based upon what society says, you want more. But in the middle of all that, everybody wants more money. And when you get more money, guess what happens? You want more. So it's not fulfilling, but it's what people seek. And the third thing they said was freedom. I just want to be free to do what I want to do in life, to find out what my purpose is. I wish I didn't have to work so hard or do these things or take care of the house. I just want to be free. And some people who go through great lengths to get what they perceive as freedom still go through life feeling very bound and restricted and captive. So we've kind of been walking through this. Okay, then what is the answer? What is it we should be seeking? And as believers, we turn to Scripture. In the first week, God said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
and everything else is added to you. That's not prosperity preaching. That doesn't mean if you seek his kingdom and his righteousness that you'll get the million dollars. It simply means that's where the hope is. That's where the truth is. That's where the peace is in seeking first as a priority his kingdom and his righteousness. And then last week we looked at scripture that told us this, that what we are to seek is the betterment of other people. You ever thought about that? That it's not about my agenda, it's not about promoting myself forward, making sure I'm taken care of. Scripture says if you are a follower of Jesus, you seek his kingdom first and foremost, and then you seek the good of other people above your own. And both of those are completely contradictory to everything the world would tell us to go after. The world would say, hey, pursue the happiness, pursue the money, find that freedom. And Jesus says, you've missed it already. You're going to spend your whole life pursuing those things, and you will never find what you're looking for. But when we turn our attention towards Christ and say, I will seek his kingdom, his righteousness, I will look for the betterment of my fellow man, I will put their needs above my own, I will learn what it means to serve, to give of myself sacrificially, that's where the Bible says you're on the right track. You're starting to seek the right things. You're starting to find the real meaning and the purpose. And so one of the things I was asking you, and we're going to hang out on this second question this morning, is what does your list look like? You may say, well, I'm kind of happy and I'm content with my salary and I feel pretty free. So your list may not be those three things. What does your list look like? And we challenged ourselves to ask this, where do you spend most of your time? Where does most of your free time, when you're not working and it's just your time, where do you spend most of your time? That can point you kind of in a direction of what you're seeking. Here was the second question. What occupies your mind? This is where we're going to dwell a little bit this morning. What occupies your mind? If you want to know what you're seeking, stop and think about what is constantly in my mind. And we're not talking about when you're at work and you're thinking about meetings. I mean when you're sitting in your recliner, the house is quiet, and you are relaxed. You lay in your bed at night, and your mind is starting to settle down from the day, and you start to think, where does your mind go? What is it that runs through your mind? Is it fear? Is it worry? Is it wondering about the next day's agenda? But if there's things in your mind that are God-honoring and Christ-centered, it points you in this direction. What occupies your mind? It can tell you exactly what it is you're seeking after. And the third thing we challenged ourselves with, if you want to know what you seek, what is it you speak about most often? What is it that's constantly on the tip of your tongue when you're in a conversation? Is it something about your life, something you've achieved, something you're pursuing, the job you're interviewing for, the person you're dating? What is always on the tip of your tongue? That is an indicator of what it is you are seeking. And one of the things I hope we will get out of this sermon this morning is focusing in on that second question, what occupies your mind? And think of it this way. Are you constantly filled in your mind, focused on temporal things, or do you find your mind drifting towards things that are eternal? Does your mind get occupied with everything that's temporal, or do you think and dwell on everything that is eternal? And I would admit this, too. I believe there is some generational stuff at play here. Would you guys agree with that? That if you're in your teens or you're in your 20s or you're graduating high school and heading off to college, it's very possible your mind is occupied with things that are more temporal because you think you've got the rest of your life ahead of you and the sky's the limit and you're moving forward and you don't think about eternal things. But you sit down and talk with a lady who's 80, 90, 98, and you ask them, where does your mind go? They're not thinking about the next big promotion at work. And what do I, what's the next car that I'm going to buy? Their mind is more focused on eternal things. And so part of what I want us to do this morning is wrestle with this, because this is what Scripture teaches. It tells us we have got to think about eternal things, because temporal things, guess what? They are temporal. They pass very quickly. So living with eternity in mind is the best way for us to live. Living with eternity in mind is the best way for us to live, and I'm going to show you why that's true. So here's our main truth for this morning. What we believe about eternity will determine how we live today. What you believe to be true about eternity will determine how you live today. It will have a huge impact, meaning this. If you think eternity is 40, 50, 60, 100 years away from you, you're going to live like it's that far away, that you have time that you've got plenty of years to get things organized, to get your life right with God, but none of us are even promised tomorrow, much less our next breath. So if we live with that in mind, that I'm not even promised I can get in my truck and get home this afternoon, it, it will change how I live and how I move among people and how I give of my time and resources. 
If I believe that in eternity I will never stand before a holy and righteous God and give an account for my life, if I just believe I drift off into nothingness or all people are going to heaven as long as you're decently good, I'm going to live my life like I'm never going to stand before a holy and righteous God and give an account for every action and every word that I've ever spoken. When how you view eternity, it will determine how you live today. When we have eternal perspectives, the things that are running through our mind, we are less likely to chase empty dreams and material gratification. When we live with this eternity in mind, we don't go after the empty things. An eternal perspective keeps us, listen to this, from wasting our years in pursuing temporal things that give us temporal pleasures. Can you hear the truth of that statement? Living life with eternity in mind and what is ahead of us keeps us from wasting years of our life chasing the wrong stuff. You ever met somebody that's lived a very rough life, made their own decisions, did it their way, did not want anything to do with God all of their life, and all of a sudden as they come towards the end of their life, they get perspective and they realize all that stuff's not important, and they give their life to Jesus, and you say to them, if there's anything you could do different, what would you do? A lot of times they will say, I would not have wasted so much time. This is their point. I, I'm to the end of this thing. I, I wouldn't have wasted so much time pursuing all that stuff. And for many of us, there's this opportunity right now today to say, I will not waste years chasing temporal empty things. I want my life to matter. I want to change the direction of where things are going. Now, here's what I know to be true. Having an eternal perspective does not come naturally. Don't miss this truth. For us to, this truth, for us to have an eternal perspective does not come naturally. And I'm going to show you how that's true in Scripture too. We are naturally not bent to focus our mind and our heart's attention on things we do not see. You with me on that? We are bent to focus our mind and our attention on things that are tangible, that are right in front of us that we can see. This is why it doesn't come natural. Here's the other reason I would tell you that it doesn't come natural, is because the enemy, listen to this, does not want us meditating, thinking, dreaming about, praying for, longing for eternal things. Because what would happen if God's people focused their mind and their attention and their resources and their efforts towards eternal things? The enemy wants to come along and say, look how nice and shiny that new truck is. Not that there's anything wrong with buying a new truck, we're not saying that. The point is when it's the consuming thing of your life, that's where it becomes a problem. And the enemy is a master of baiting the hook with the right thing that keeps us focused on temporal things and not eternal things. If holding an eternal perspective came naturally to us, he being Jesus, Paul, Peter, other that we're going to look at this morning in the verses, there would be no need for them to tell us to th seek things that are above. You with me on that? If it came naturally for us, once you became a believer, your mind was somehow changed to completely focus on eternal things, Jesus himself and all the other writers wouldn't have to spend so much time saying, stop thinking about temporal things, focus on eternal things. We would already be there. Our minds would already go there. It is not natural for us. So we must choose to continually, day in and day out, set our minds on things that are eternal. We have to seek things that are eternal. We must seek things that are above. And that word seeking, if you connect the definition, it doesn't mean just sit around and meditating. That could be part of it. Sometimes seeking is applying the right disciplines in your life that you get in God's word. And it's not just when I'm up here telling you about God's word on Sunday morning. That it's a regular habit of your life that you listen, you read, you consume the truth of who God is so it can counter all the temporal lowly things that we think about and it lifts our mind to eternal things we have to choose to set our minds on things above as we develop this habit of setting our minds on eternal things we begin to handle things differently down here think about that as our mind is sitting on eternal things having an eternal perspective it changes the way we act down here having this eternal perspective I would tell you in many ways is the key to actually living a fully devoted Christian life it is one of the massive keys to living out your faith is having an eternal perspective listen to what Paul said in 2nd Corinthians he said for our light and momentary troubles 
you ever feel like your troubles here on this earth are light and momentary? I think all of us would probably say no. When you're in the middle of the trouble, it does not feel momentary. It feels weighty. It consumes your attention. It screams at you that you have a problem in your life. And Paul writes and says, in reality, it is light and momentary. That's an eternal perspective. And when we enter these light and momentary troubles, look what he says. They are actually achieving for us glory that far outweighs them all. Can you see the eternal perspective? That when we're in trouble, when something's not going right in the temporal level, there's a part of us that says, this is light, it's momentary, it's going to pass. And when I compare what I'm dealing with to the eternal glory that awaits me, that is so much greater. I can endure, I can stay faithful because it outweighs them. Then look what he says. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen. There's the key. Do not fix your eyes on what is seen, but we fix our eyes on what is unseen because what is unseen is the eternal. Do you see where it's resonating with us? It is screaming to us to say, everything we fix our eyes on typically in any given day, everything our eyes physically look at is temporal and it will be gone. It is all of the unseen things, the things that we can't even comprehend, the Bible tells us. Things that God has planned for us that our brains cannot even process what is ahead of us. Those are the things that we live for. Those are the things that are eternal. This is why people will come into church sometimes and say, you know what? I feel like God has called me to sell everything I got and move to India and be a missionary. And we might even scratch our heads. I mean, I hope not as people of faith and say, what are you talking about? That is somebody's heart who says, it, is, it does not matter. The temporal things don't matter. I want to live for something that's eternal. People that will come in and say, I'm going to readjust the direction of my life and the things that I live for. I'm going to make a job change. I'm going to live different. I'm going to give more. I'm going to spend more time. Whatever it is, it is people who are saying, I can see the unseen. My mind and my spiritual eyes are set on eternal things, not temporal things. It's a powerful way to live. I would say for most of us, though, we don't see any further than the horizons of this world. So God comes along and says, I want to correct your short-sightedness. God gives us this vision correction that says, start looking at things through the lens of eternity. Start looking at conversations, relationships, habits that are in your life through this lens of eternal value and consequence. Suddenly, when we do that, watch what happens. We realize this present life is a brief window of opportunity to invest in what will last for eternity. See the difference? When we start to set our minds on eternal things, the unseen things, it changes the way we live down here because we then say this life is an opportunity. It is a brief window. The Bible says it's like a mist. It's like a vapor. It's like the grass. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. It goes so fast. Look for the unseen. And we do that. We look around and say this is a brief window that I can have an impact that will resonate for all of eternity. That the choice I make today, listen, this is a hard truth, but it is absolutely scriptural. The choice that you and I make today could resonate and will resonate with us 10 million years from now. That's heavy to think about. Heavy to think about. The things that we do today will resonate for all of eternity. There's an opportunity here in the mist, in the vapor that we have to live right. Knowing that this present world will end and we will be resurrected into a new heaven and new earth should profoundly change the way we behave here. Let me read to you 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Listen to how Peter put this. He said, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Think about what a thief is. You don't know he's coming. He doesn't send you a letter in the mail that says Tuesday night at 10, I'm gonna invade and steal from your house. He does it secretly. He does it when you don't know. This is what the Bible's talking about. He's going to come like a thief. You will not know what's coming. The heavens will disappear with a roar. Listen to that. The heavens are going to disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Listen to that statement. Peter is saying everything on the earth, every country, every people, every kingdom, every president, all of it will be laid bare. Not a single city standing on its building or on its foundations. 
Everything will be consumed with fire and laid bare on the entire earth. And then Peter processes logically, and he says, hey, since everything's going to be destroyed this way, what kind of people should we be? How should we live? Look at what he says. You ought to live holy, talking about in this lower level life. You should live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and you speed its coming, meaning you want it to come quickly. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, look what we are doing. We are seeking. We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. This is what we're talking about this morning, seeking a new city putting our mind on eternal things, that we seek a kingdom that says, man, there is a day coming where there will be no sin, there will be no curse, it will be God's kingdom on earth and righteousness will dwell. What does that mean? Everything will be right. So Peter says, speed that up. Long for that, put your attention there, live that way, because everything you see, everything you touch in this world will be consumed. Only heaven and eternal things will matter. When we view today, these moments, in view of the long tomorrow, the littlest choices become incredibly significant. Think about that. When we really grasp and set our minds on things above, the littlest choices today become of great significance, whether I read my Bible today or I don't, whether I choose to get up and pray or I don't pray, whether I choose to, as tired as I am, to get up and come to church and be around God's people or I don't. If I choose to trust Christ through suffering, if I choose to share my faith, give of my resources, these actions graciously empowered by his spirit, it is of eternal consequence, not only for other souls, but for mine. This is how it changes. When our mind is set on things of eternal things, everything becomes powerful. That we wouldn't fathom saying, why would I not get in God's word? It is one of the only things that is eternal that will always be here. It's never going to fade. It's been around for thousands of years. Even though people have tried to ruin it and take it away and burn it, it never happens. It constantly remains. God's kingdom is eternal. It'll always be there, no matter what people do. No matter how many people try and fight against it, God's kingdom's gonna be there. It's eternal. And people, only three things that are eternal. People are eternal. So when you live your life with an eternal perspective, think about how that would change just an average conversation over coffee. That you're living with this mindset that this one hour sipping a cup of coffee in conversation with this person could resonate in all of eternity and could matter 10 million years from now. And you say, well, how is that possible? What if the person you're having coffee with has no idea who Jesus is? Never thinks in their mind and in their heart about eternal things. And you have one hour dedicated of their time drinking a cup of coffee And your whole conversation is about Georgia football and finances and the president and who's doing this. Completely, radically changes the way you view that conversation. At least it should for us. Joni Eric Satata said this in her book, Heaven, Your Real Home. Listen to what she said. She said, when a Christian realizes that their citizenship is in heaven, he begins acting as a responsible citizen of earth. What a great truth. He invests wisely in relationships because he knows they're eternal. His conversations, goals, and motives become pure and honest because he realizes they're going to have bearing on their lasting reward. He gives generously of time, money, and talent because he's laying up treasures for eternity. He spreads the good news of Christ because he longs to fill heaven's ranks with his friends and neighbors. All this serves the pilgrim well, not only in heaven but on earth, for it serves everybody around him. Think about that. Believers who live with eternity in mind, who say, I will seek first the kingdom of God. I will seek the betterment of others. I will view every small decision, every small act with eternal consequence. Think about how that would better the people around you. That your conversations become meaningful and weighty. And listen, what we're not saying here, don't, take, don't get me wrong. I am not saying every word that comes out of my mouth has to be about Jesus. I can talk fishing and football and work But it's the point that that is secondary. That's not the priority of what I'm after in conversations. But we can certainly talk about those things. It is people who say at some point, this relationship, this conversation, whatever it is, I've got to turn it to something eternal. I have to encourage these people in their faith. 
This is living for eternal things. Look at what Hebrews 13, 14 says. This is our main verse for the sermon this morning. Then I'm going to share with you some misconceptions about heaven as we wrap this up. Hebrews 13, 14 says this. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. That's our main verse for this thought. We don't have an enduring city. You realize Jackson will not be here forever. The city of Atlanta will not stand for all of eternity. We do not have an enduring city here. Therefore, we are looking for a city that is to come. And the Bible tells us, I'll show you this verse in a second, that the city that is to come, the architect, the engineer, the builder of that is God. Can you imagine what is in store? We'll get there in a second. So, as we, we're going to transition our sermon here into misconceptions. Eminent scientist. Stephen Hawking, when asked about heaven, here's what he said, the belief that heaven or an fairy tale for a people who are afraid of death, there is nothing beyond the moment when the brain flickers for the last time. That was his statement as this brilliant scientist when asked about eternal things. He said, it's just a pipe dream for people who are scared to die. When your brain flickers for the last time, that's it. There's nothing else. And I would tell you, if Stephen Hawking did not give his life to Jesus, the reality of how false his statement is, is fully lived out for all of eternity. Don't miss that. Heaven is not a fairy tale. It is not a dream. It is reality. It is a promise. Listen to this. It is a promise from God to his people. It is a promise that is as weighty and secure as your salvation is. Do you feel that? The promise of an eternal home of perfection where righteousness dwells is as sure as your salvation is. And if there is no sure promise, what are we doing? Why are we here every Sunday? Why, why do we do this if there's no promise of an eternal, glorious home where what we do in this life matters? Heaven is described over and over again in the Bible. The word heaven is found 276 times just in the New Testament this looking forward, this promise of a better day to come. But so many people have misconceptions about heaven. I'm going to share with you three of them. There's a bunch. But I want to share what I believe are three of the biggest ones. The first one is this. Heaven is going to be boring. Now, I would say all of us have probably thought that. You may not have thought it in the last five years, but maybe when you were five, six, 10, 15 years old, that might have went through your mind. I can tell you, if we're being honest, growing up in church, and people would sing the song, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise. And I would think, I'm going to sing for 10,000 years? <laughs> and I have no less days? Like, that's really just the start of it? This is going to be boring. Or how many of you have thought this? That when I get to heaven, it's going to be like this. When I, this is more of a kid thought, but it was there. This chubby little baby angel in this weird diaper thing sitting on a cloud. This is what runs through my mind when I was a kid, like heaven's gonna be boring. What are we gonna do for millions and millions and millions of years? It's mind blowing. I would think, well, won't I get bored in heaven? You know, I can get bored 20 minutes into cutting grass, even though I love cutting grass. There's days it's boring. I can't imagine 10 million years of doing something. I can get bored very easily in a TV program, can't even make it 20 minutes through the program, I gotta change it. How will I not be bored in heaven? It crosses our mind that says, won't things lose their luster or their taste? This whole novelty and intrigue of what heaven is, it's going to fade just like things do on earth. People say, well, I used to love to do this hobby, but then I grew into this hobby, and now I do this, and I want to go, I want to go do this and hike this. We always have these things because we get bored with what has happened before. So we kind of think, well, won't heaven be like that? How can I consistently be fulfilled? Eternity is a really long time. And when you think about it, if we're being honest, there are times, and I am a pastor of a church, but I don't know everything. And I certainly struggle with my walk with Jesus just like you do. And there are times, if I'm being honest, I can lay in my bed at night and I can think about eternity and it will freak me out sometimes. Does it do that for you or am I the only one? It'll kind of mess with your head. Because I don't know eternity. I can't comprehend eternal things. I know temporal. I know things break. 
I know things wind down. I know family members that get buried. I can't comprehend eternal. I also, as you, I can't think of things where there's no curse, where there's no sin, where there's no brokenness. We've never not known that. We have only known a world full of sin and brokenness and sickness and disease and selfishness and these glimmers of hope, of righteousness and glory and people who love Jesus. So it's hard for us to get our brain around this perfect paradise that God promises us. After 10 million years, will I really have the same desire that I had the first day I stepped into heaven? It's a good question to think about. 10 million years, 20 million years, will it be as passionate to me as it was day one when I took my first deep breath of a righteous heaven? It's hard to comprehend. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Just think about that verse for a minute. When you think about being bored in heaven, Paul comes along and says, there is not a single eye on the planet that has ever existed that has seen the things that you're going to see when you get to heaven, things that God has prepared. How long will it take me to see those things? Then he says, you've not even heard about it. Nobody has had a conversation, written a book about it, shared an idea with you. Nothing has come into your ears that even comes close to what God has prepared for us. And then he says this, there's not a strong enough mind on the planet that has even thought up what God has thought up for us. Do you see how big this is? That if God who could speak and the entire universe come into existence has prepared a place for you and me for thousands upon thousands of years to where Paul says, you can't even see it, you can't even hear it, there is nothing that can come in your mind that will prepare you for what God has for you. That is what is ahead of us. This is what we are looking for. Our minds cannot grasp the blessing God has for us. The Bible tells us some things about heaven, but it's a limited view. Whatever we wonder about, whatever we think about, heaven is a guaranteed to be better. Whatever joyous news you've heard on this earth, there's greater news ahead of you. Even the most incredible wonders that you might have seen on this earth. For me, one of those was the Grand Canyon. You ever been there? You stand on the edge of it, it just kind of takes your breath away. I mean, it takes you a minute to process how big this thing really is. And when you look at it on a map, you realize you're a piece of dust because this thing is so massive and you stand on this one spot of this massive canyon. The Bible says even seeing that cannot compare to what God has prepared for us. Thinking that heaven will be boring is a heresy and it communicates that God is boring. Don't miss that. For us to sit here and think, well, heaven's going to be boring is, a, is, a, is an essence saying, God, you are boring. You have no creative, imaginative work. You haven't really prepared anything great other than a cloud that I'm going to sit on and I'm going to sing for 10,000 years at least. That's what I got. It is a heresy that God is boring. God is not boring. Do you know scripture says that we will know and be known in heaven? You ever thought about that? You're not gonna be some stranger. People will know you. They will know interactions they had with you. They won't know you as you are today because the Bible says I'm gonna have and you're gonna have a glorified body. Our bodies will be like Jesus. Thank goodness for that. Because I've eaten too many donuts in my day. <laughs> the Bible talks about there will be fellowship in heaven like we know today. That we'll be able to sit and talk to one another and have conversation. And I hope there's a big green egg on the back porch of my mansion. <laughs> and people can come over and I can grill hamburgers and hot dogs. One of my favorite things to do is be with the people I love and grill stuff on the grill and just hang out. I hope God has that in store for me. And you know what God says? I got something better. Because scripture says I can't even perceive it. I can't even think about what he has for me. My mind cannot comprehend it. So for me to say, God, it would be really cool if there was a big green egg and a lake I could fish in and a golf course next to my house, God says, I got something better. You hadn't even thought about it. This is what heaven will be like. Listen to what Revelation says. No longer will there be any curse. Do you hear that? No more curse in heaven. What does that mean? No more sin. 
No more disease, no more sickness, no more selfishness. There's no longer a curse. It is completely gone. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in that city, and his servants, that's us, will serve him. Do you see that? The Bible says you will have a role in heaven. There will be a task. There will be a job that I have and you have that we will do and we will serve, and God will be right there. And look at what it says. They will see his face. Is that not beautiful? You and I will see his face. The people that I love who have died before me, they have seen his face already. And they have their role, their task. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not not be a need for the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. The Lord will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. What does that mean? I'm going to reign with Jesus forever and ever. I, I couldn't tell you. But this is what scripture says. We will reign with him. You're not just going to sit there and sing songs. You will have purpose. You will have task. You will be reigning with him. There will be no curse. Everything will be perfect. We will know each other and be known. Can you get this? And the Bible says it's paradise. It's beyond anything you could ever imagine. It will not be boring. It's an eternal home with no curse. It's a place where we will serve. It's a place where we will see his face. We will reign with him forever and ever. How in the world can it be boring? Here's the truth. Whatever we can possibly imagine, heaven will be better. Whatever you can possibly imagine, heaven will be better. Here, here's the second misconception about heaven. It's this, that this world is our home. This world is our home. So if you got your Bibles, look at Philippians 3, where we started out this morning early on. Philippians chapter 3, go down to verse 17. Paul said, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, look what he says, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Don't put your eyes on people that don't live for Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on people that are doing all that they can to live for Jesus. Not that they're perfect, but they're doing all they can to live for Jesus. Verse 18, for what... For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Do you believe that? Many people live their lives as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Watch this statement. Their mind is set on earthly things. What's he saying? They are seeking constantly the temporal, earthly things. That's the people you should not set your attention on because destruction is ahead of them. Look what he says in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. Currently, right now, our citizenship is in heaven. And we are eagerly awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. That is a beautiful text. Keep your minds on eternal things. A Savior is coming from there, and he will transform your lowly, broken body into his glorious body, and you will be taken into this glorious, eternal paradise that you cannot even comprehend how awesome it is going to be. This is the stuff we're talking about. A citizen, this text calls us, it is a person who legally belongs to another country. They're, they have the rights and the protection of that country. Paul says we are citizens of heaven. We belong there. We have the rights and the protection of that country. Citizens adopt the practice of the culture and the kingdom that they belong to. This is true. You think about an American citizen or citizen of any other country. They embrace the things that country stands for. But Paul says we are actually citizens of heaven. Listen to me, church. We are not Americans first. Can you hear me on that? I am thankful that God put us here and the freedoms that we have. But if you know Jesus, you are a citizen of heaven first. He determines how you live. He controls the way that you think and the things that you stand for. Everything else is secondary. We are citizens of heaven. Citizens conduct themselves in accordance with the country to which they belong. So as a citizen of heaven, we are free, listen to this, from the wrath of God. 
You're free from the wrath of God. We are free from the enslavement of sin. We have a king and a high priest who intercedes on our behalf at the right hand of God. He is our advocate to the Father. The Bible says because we are citizens of heaven, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. This is what is true about us. So that tells us if our citizenship is in heaven, we are just sojourners in this life. We are just passing through. Temporary residents who are awaiting and seeking and longing for an eternal home. This is who we are. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews broke this down. These are some powerful verses, so I, I pray you stay with me as we close this out. Hebrews 10, 34 says this, you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted this confiscation of your property. Why? Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Can I ask you this in regards to that verse? If somebody showed up next week at your house, knocked on the door and said, we're confiscating your house, your truck, your boat, your guns, everything you got, all your possessions were taken. How do you think most people would react? Probably not very Christ-like. And I'm being honest. I, I don't think my first reaction would be, come take it. It's all yours. <laughs> but this is what the writer of Hebrews says. These people gladly, joyfully, joyfully accepted the confiscation of their properties. Why? Because they knew there was something better ahead. The house is brick and mortar and sheetrock. It's going to be consumed when Christ returns. It will rot because termites get in it. Things happen. But there is a city ahead of me that I cannot even comprehend how beautiful and wonderful and it's prepared for me. So yeah, take my stuff. Joyfully take my stuff because I'm looking elsewhere. Hebrews 11.10 says this, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That's referring to Abraham when God said, get up and go, Abraham. And he's like, where am I going? Just go. And he said, okay. So Abraham gets up and he leaves. Why would he do that? Why would he leave what he knew and what was his? Because he looked forward to a city whose architect, the man who designed it, who engineered it, is God. I would leave for that city too. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 talks about how people willingly gave up their life for their faith. And it says, instead, they were longing for a better country. That's why they were willing to die for their faith. Hebrews 11 tells us, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has, watch this, prepared a city for them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Can you imagine a believer, if it ever came to this in Jackson, Butts County, a member of our church, laid down their life for the Lord Jesus simply because they thought there's a better city than Jackson prepared for me, and the architect is God. That's what I'm looking towards. This is what faith really means. As sojourners, we realize this world is not our home Therefore, we do not store up treasures here where moth and rust destroy. See the connection of what Jesus taught us. It's not where we belong. We don't fit in here. Billy Graham said this in a very simple statement towards the end of his life, my home is heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. What a great way to have an eternal perspective. Here's the third and final thing. We're wrapping up with this. I appreciate you being patient with me. The third and final misconception that we want to hit on this morning is this. All people are going to heaven that all people are going to heaven. There is a study done by Pew Research that said this, 72% of Americans believe in heaven, and they define it as a place where people who have led good lives are eternally rewarded. 72% of people in America say, I believe in heaven, and I believe if you're good, you go there. That's not what Scripture teaches. Not all people go to this beloved, wonderful paradise. People have different ideas about heaven. And many have no understanding of God at all, but they still like to think of heaven as a much better place where we all go when we die. Ideas about heaven are really no more than vague hopes of saying, man, maybe I'll win the lottery today. This is how people who have this mindset feel like, maybe I'll get into heaven, maybe I'll be good enough to get there, just like maybe I'll win the lottery today and have millions of dollars. The Bible has so much to say about life after death, and it completely contradicts what most people believe about heaven. So stay with me on this. In John 3, 16, a very popular verse, 
It says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have paradise. They will have eternal life. Not everybody goes to heaven. Good people may not be in heaven. Jesus said, it is those who believe in Jesus that don't perish. They get paradise. If you go down to verse 36, it says this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, has paradise, has the promise of heaven. But those who reject the Son will not see life because God's wrath remains on them. Nothing has changed positionally about who they are before the Father. They need the righteousness of Christ. It is all in believing on the Son. And listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once, and after that they will face the judgment. Do you see this? Not all good people go to heaven. People who believe in Jesus. But every person will die once. And the Bible tells us very clearly, when that day of death comes for me, I will step out of the temporal of this world and I will breathe breath of eternal things and I will see Jesus face to face and give an account for my life. And I can tell you for years that would scare me to death. You with me on that? It would scare me to death. Because I always thought, well, if I have to stand there on my own merit, I am in big, big trouble. But this is what Scripture says, that when we believe in Jesus and I stand before the Father, I don't stand there on my own merit because there's not enough good I can do. I stand there in the righteousness of Christ. And when he sees me, he doesn't see all my failings and my brokenness and how I messed up and misstepped in this life. He sees in me the blood of Jesus. He sees me covered in the righteousness of Christ. And therefore, he will say to me, Doug, paradise. This, this area, this city, this promised land that I have designed for you and built for you and your brain can't even comprehend, it's yours. Why? Because all I did was believe in Jesus. It's very difficult for us to get our brain around this because we feel like we got to behave right. We got to act certain ways. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. That's what gets communicated a lot from the pulpit. But you can act and behave in all the right ways and never believe Jesus is who he said he was. And you can convince yourself you're a good person because I act and behave correctly. And you will never get paradise. It is all through Jesus. We have no way to make our wrongs right. Our good will never outweigh our bad this is why we need Jesus. Our sin, our sin ruins everything, just like one drop of arsenic in a glass of water ruins the whole glass. One misstep, one false step in us ruins it all, the Bible says. If you break the law in one area, you've broken all of it. Just like you can't say, well, it's only one drop of arsenic in the glass, I'll be good. Doesn't work that way. Sin is the same way. So what happened? God came, he took on skin, he put flesh on. Jesus walked among us, God in flesh, and he showed us, you can have paradise by believing I am exactly who I said I am. And that I died on a cross for you. This is what gets us paradise. The price was paid. The people that go to heaven are all alike in one way. We are all sinners who have believed in Jesus Christ. We're all alike in that one aspect. Every person that will be in heaven will all be there because they said, I am a sinner and I believed in Jesus. That's the one thing that'll make us all alike in heaven. It's true for all of us. So listen to this, here's the truth as we close out. Good people do not go to heaven, saved people do. Good people do not go to heaven, saved people do. So since there is this resurrection that is to come for God's children, it tells us this, we haven't passed the peak of happiness that we're gonna experience. As all the happy moments you've had in this life, it's not anywhere close to what is ahead of you. There is really no need for bucket lists because our new universe and adventures will far exceed anything we could possibly experience in this life. The Bible tells us the reality is that we really will live happily ever after. It is not a fairy tale. It is not wishful thinking. It is a promise through the blood-bought 
body of Jesus Christ, that heaven is our home. And we should daily look forward to a world without evil, without suffering, without death, where God will live and wipe away every tear from our eye forever. We should live with this eternal view that heaven is a place of no mores, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more separation from loved ones because death will be conquered. There will be no curse. Here's the truth. Heaven is the absence of everything bad, painful, and evil, and it is the presence of everything good, holy, and glorious. And as we close with this last verse, think about this, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. This awe of what God has prepared, the architect has set up for us. So as Ben and our praise team come, I invite you to stand with me as we close out this morning. And I'm going to pray for us as they get settled in. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that it has encouraged those who are believers born again in the Lord Jesus Christ that there is a better day ahead. That it has challenged believers, Father, that to change the way they think, that to take our minds off temporal things and place it on eternal things. God, that it helps us to understand that you have prepared something that we cannot see, hear, comprehend. It's just unimaginable what you have prepared for us. God, it encourages me to know that I will see and know and recognize my father, my grandfather, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles who have passed before me, friends that I've had who have passed way too young. God, it is an encouragement to me to know that I will have fellowship with people I care about that I will be able to see them, recognize them, communicate, God, interact with them. God, that more than anything, it encourages me that your word says, I will see the face of Jesus, that I will place my very own eyes on him, the one who died for me, who saved me from my sins, who called me into salvation and gave me purpose in this life. And God, it is beyond comprehension of what the reaction will be when I see the promise of heaven, my loved ones, and I see the face of my Savior. But God, I'm just thankful that you made a way for me to go. And God, I pray for those in the room this morning who are processing what they've heard. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you move in their heart and in their mind to understand that this is truth. This is not a fairy tale. This is not made up. Spirit of God, bring conviction that this is the absolute truth. Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He proved it time and time again. History proves it. The lives of people that have been changed proves it. An eternal life is not a fairy tale. It is a promise for anyone who would believe. So God, I ask that you would help people to believe. Help people to believe. Jesus is who he said he was. And God, this morning, may the population of heaven change because people believed on you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we close this morning, the altar is open if you want to come pray. I've shared with you before, there's nothing magical about coming down front and talking to me, but I'd love to talk to you. If for the first time this morning you say, hey, I believe in what you're saying, I get it but I really don't know what to do now, I'd love to talk to you. Or if you say, I hear what you're saying, but I got a lot of questions. I'm not sure I believe. I would love to help answer those questions if I can. So make your way to the front. Come talk to me or be in the back at the end of the service. Just however God wants to move in your life, I pray that you let him do it.
as the lion away What a glorious dawn Fear of death is gone For we carry his life in our veins Jesus, to you we lift our eyes Jesus, our glory and our pride We adore you, behold you, I say Amen. It's been a great morning, hasn't it? Get to celebrate with Hannah. You know, I've been so uh, honored to be able to serve with her over the last year and a half that I've been here. And uh, just, uh, Hannah, uh, congratulations. We know God's going to do great things with you. Uh, just a reminder, Doug will be in the back. If you are a visitor, please go talk to him uh, or talk to Jason, or I'll be in the front. Come talk to one of us. We'd love to say hello. Uh, can, our, can our members... Can we let our visitors know how glad we are they're here? That's great. So let's uh, let's go be the hands and feet of Jesus. You